How do you speed up Kafka by 40%? How do you prepare for a system design interview? And how do you generate realistic test data and use it with test containers? Let's figure out together in the Architecture Weekly number 46. Let's go! And before we start, make sure to be subscribed to the channel, hit this like button, or if you have any suggestions or comments or any ideas on what content you want to include in the next issue, please leave me a comment down below. Okay, the biggest event of this week is the Amazon reInvent conference where they present their new services and products. And the most important one, I think, is the complete reduction of the Amazon Lambda cold start. They managed to reduce it by 90% by using the snapshot uh, functionality. So basically they have an image of your function and it speed up like 10 times faster. That's awesome. Another thing uh, happened this week is that advent of code started and basically it's 25 tasks uh, in programming field that uh, you might want to do every day. Okay, what I want to highlight this week from the article perspective uh, is uh, the uh, combination of the technologies of test containers and synthesized I.O. So test containers allow you for the really awesome uh, integration tests. So basically, if you need uh, a database or another service to, to test uh, your piece of functionality, you just instruct test containers to get those containers up and running within your test. But if you test against the database, you need like real data or at least not real data, but the data that looks very much real from your business perspective. And here where synthesized I.O. comes into play because they are able to learn from their data and generate realistic data. This week, uh, both companies announced that now they have a seamless integration between each other. So you can really run your test in, te in test containers with the data generated by synthesized I.O. So check out the repository and the attached video where they discuss how it works together. Okay, another thing that happened um, this week is the publication of the topic GC article from LinkedIn. And basically this is a story about improving the performance of uh, Kafka clients by 40%. That's stunning. So what they actually discovered is that even if you do have empty topics and think that they don't put any pressure on your Kafka cluster, like you're not very right with that because there's a lot of metadata, there's still synchronization between partition and the uh, zookeeper and so on and so on. So what LinkedIn did, they came up with a system that uh, will pull all over the, the topics, figure out uh, what, uh, which topics are dead, like basically not used uh, for the last 60 days and eliminate them. So this is a real cool journey uh, about how they came up with the solution and uh, what they uh, did in the end and you know some results. So like, you know, improved 30% uh, performance is awesome. And the last highlight of the week is, of course, preparing for the system design and coding interview. So basically, with many companies in Europe and the US and uh, other places on Earth, system design interview is an important step because it allows you to prove that you're actually a senior or a staff engineer instead uh, of a middle one. So this is really a step where you show your competence and ability to design a system, basically what we all want to do. And here, generally, Oresh from his Pragmatic Engineer blog describes, you know, the books, the courses that you might want to attend, some uh, resources where you can pass the mock interview and so on and so on. And even the Discord servers that you might want to join to discuss those problems in order to prepare the system design interview. Uh, the good thing is that like if you need a private consultation, I can do that uh, for you myself and I will attach the link uh, where you can, you know, drop, drop a request uh, for that.
Okay, it's time for the follow-up sections, another six or seven articles uh, that I want to include this time. And the first one is uh, the how do one-time passwords work? So we all have this uh, one-time password application on our phones when we want to access the GitHub or maybe for the access of online banking, etc., etc. And usually what happens is that you can scan a QR code and then magically the numbers appears on your phone and when you put them in the GitHub or other applications, they magically work. So how does actually the server knows uh, what's, uh, what, what, what password to expect from your side? Obviously there are some uh, hashes there, some encryption and so on and so on. So basically they use uh, HMAC based uh, password. Uh, follow the article in order to understand uh, how it works and how you can implement one in like just 20 lines of code. Okay, next one is creating uh, the distributed database in Kubernetes with existing monolithic database. And this article is all about uh, how to migrate from uh, your monolithic database cluster to some distributed database while using the Kubernetes for managing your containers. And what comes helpful is the Apache sharding sphere that I actually covered already in the issue number 34 of this newsletter. And the Kubernetes is a really popular orchestration uh, solution for containers. But the question is like, uh, how do you combine this, you know, cloud thing while well, using containers, scaling everything up and down with the monolithic database that we used to have for the last uh, 20 years? And the answer is that we can include an additional layer on top of our databases that will do all this distributed complex thing for us. So it will manage sharding, it will manage uh, distributed transaction and so on and so on. And this is just, you know, adding uh, the thing on top of your database. So follow the article. There are a lot of schemes and explanations on how it will potentially work. And the next one is an absolute banger of a performance investigation. So Netflix shared a couple of weeks ago an article on how they immigrated to a more powerful virtual machines, but unfortunately were not able to hit their uh, RPS goal. And they started to dig in, out, uh, dig in uh, what, what was the problem. And uh, they discovered that the problem was uh, due to the false sharing thing uh, in the GVM. And they, uh, and they just straight went and uh, fixed the problem uh, uh, in, the, in the GVM and uh, managed to increase the performance, but unfortunately not completely, uh, because there was another problem there about true sharing. So they patched the GVM again and managed to increase the performance and increase the RP, RPC by more than three times. So follow the article, it has a lot of details, a lot of, you know, uh, assembler uh, instructions and so on. And uh, I will include the link to another article that explains what false sharing and true sharing actually is. Okay, last two pieces for today. Uh, the first one is uh, six event driven architecture patterns, uh, like the first part. So this particular article includes only three of them. And this is from Wix. And Wix is a company that allows you to build a website in a matter of minutes. And uh, uh, the guy from uh, there, Nathan, uh, he's uh, leading the data streams uh, department there. And he shared how they uh, applied the, you know, even driven uh, patterns to solve their problems, like introducing the separation of writing and readings with Kafka. Another one uh, is uh, how do you do, do you provide the updates for the browser while your workflow is going and several others. So follow the article. Another one for today is the introduction to generative adversarial networks. So do you remember Meet Journey and the other generative uh, neural networks? They basically try to generate some picture or other piece uh, for you. Uh, and uh, you might wonder, how do they do that? And this course, it is uh, really short. It's like seven or, or eight parts and no hands on there. But they explain how the, those networks consist of uh, two parts, uh, the generator and discriminator, and how through the loops of the learning, the dis discriminator explains to the generator uh, where it should change its output in order to fit the discrimination function better. So follow the course, it's really fun. 
And the last one for today is an article of Uwe Friedrichsen, uh, whose articles we included several times in newsletter already. And this time he touches the topic about how to embrace a constant change in our world. And uh, actually he stresses out that uh, humans don't like changes, right? Because it's stressful. It requires some mental ability to adapt for a new technology, for a new methodology and for the new world in general. And what he advises is to adapt the mentality of embracing the constant change, right? So as everything changes all the time, then this change is the constant. So we can see ourselves as people who adapt very well to the constant change. And if, we, and if we adapt this mental model, then our life may be a little less stressful. Okay, and actually that's it for today. Thank you very much for viewing. If you like the video, don't forget to subscribe. And if you really like the newsletter, uh, feel free to support me at patreon.com or, or boosty.2. And if you have any suggestions about the article that uh, I want to include in the next uh, newsletter or you just have some feedback, don't hesitate to leave a comment down below. And the last one for today is that uh, next week I will be on the vacation, so no newsletter for uh, you next uh, Sunday, folks. Sorry, uh, take a short break, revisit my old issues. There's plenty of content there. And yeah, have a nice week.